Uncharted Waters New Horizons is a video game I purchased complete in box shortly after the publication of my first Uncharted Waters review. And when I was doing these videos in loose chronological order, New Horizons release date came and went, only there was no review. I opted to talk about Eye of the Beholder instead. Seeing as how I love the first game so much, you may be asking, why? Why would you skip over the sequel? It's because I was fucking terrified. I was afraid I would not like New Horizons. I was afraid I would not have anything to say about New Horizons, due to it being so similar to the original. I booted up the game, saw that it had six different selectable campaigns, and then I was terrified that New Horizons would take 180 hours to beat. Then I started playing and was somewhat overwhelmed by its new mechanics. Then I put the game away and put this episode on hold. Somehow, Eye of the Beholder, a first-person dungeon crawler on Super Nintendo, using the Super Nintendo mouse, was a less intimidating game than New Horizons. I saw a sequel to one of my newly favorite games, noticed instantly that it was deeper and more mechanically complex than the original, yet at the same time improving upon every aspect of the user experience. And that was kind of a bone-crunching realization. It shook me to my core. Does that not make sense? It probably doesn't. So let's see if I can attempt to explain this. In sports, basketball in particular, there's this expression called the disease of more. The general idea is when a great team upgrades its individual talent, just because specific players are better doesn't necessarily mean that the resulting team will be more successful. The 2006-7 Phoenix Suns won 61 games, made it to the second round of the playoffs before losing to the eventual champion San Antonio Spurs. They then replaced their center, Kurt Thomas, who was okay, an average NBA caliber player, I'd say, but not somebody you've probably ever heard of. They replaced him with Shaquille O'Neal, one of the greatest and most dominating forces in NBA history, only two years removed from a championship in Miami. On paper, it's a no-brainer. Would you rather have Kurt Thomas or Shaquille O'Neal? Well, in his first full season with the Phoenix Suns, they won 46 games and didn't even make the playoffs. How did that happen? The rest of the team was exactly the same. It's because nothing's an exact science. You can have great players, but if they don't fit together well, then it doesn't matter. You can apply this same line of thinking to any media. With a microscope, you can zero in on any individual aspect of a book or movie, or in this case, a video game, see how much everything has improved, and yet the result could end up being a lesser game. So even though I saw that Uncharted Waters New Horizons was better in most aspects, I wasn't sure I would like the game as much. Because the appeal to me on the original Uncharted Waters sat on a razor's edge. It was obtuse enough to give you the satisfaction of unraveling and figuring out how it worked, while still being simple enough for me to wrap my dumb head around. It made a great half-idle game where you still need to pay attention, but you don't necessarily need to focus 100% on it. You can accomplish a lot in Uncharted Waters while doing the dishes, or folding clothes, or watching YouTube on your laptop. I was worried that New Horizons would overcomplicate itself, that it would introduce new mechanics that, while more impressive or immersive, would make it more of a pain to play, more difficult to understand, leading to a more in-depth experience, but one that I did not personally enjoy as much. That's what I was afraid of going in, but now after having beaten all six campaigns, I was wrong. I should have trusted in Koei. The original Uncharted Waters is the only game in this entire series to date that I would occasionally go back and play more of after my video was released. Normally when a video is done, that's it. I'm never gonna look at that game ever again. My opinion is crystallized in the moment and it's time to move on to the bigger and better. No time to dwell on the past because I need to turn the page on whatever's coming next. But Uncharted Waters had this strange, longer-lasting spell on me. Even months later, I would still think about it, hum its tunes to myself. Did you know that the same woman who composed both Uncharted Waters games would go on to do... 
Uncharted Waters would not allow itself to escape my mind. At least until now, because after spending time with New Horizons, I can't imagine ever going back to the original. New Horizons is a time hole. You enter at 3, leave at 10, without even realizing. Once you adjust, it contains the exact same addictive qualities its predecessor had. The original was a game where you spent most of your time watching a little boat sail from one end of the screen to another, over and over again. New Horizons, well for one it scrolls, so it's one continuous screen, but its largest additive is speed. New Horizons is original, streamlined in just the right spots, while adding just enough to make for a better game, while not overcomplicating itself. There was this bit in my original video where I timed how long it took to sail from Lisbon to Mecca. 11 minutes, 26 seconds, and 59 frames, by the way. And here's that same track in New Horizons. I'm using the slowest starting ship in the game, and I'm a little unlucky needing to wait out not one, but two storms. And despite that, I still improve on the original's time by over four minutes. If I didn't need to wait out any storms, and I prepared by getting a faster ship, it's not unreasonable for me to think that this could be done in under four minutes. It's faster, more complex, and the whole thing works because all six campaigns hyper-focus on one specific playstyle. You don't need to learn everything all at once. The original's core mechanic, buying and selling goods in order to make a profit, what Uncharted Waters is built around, only really comes into play in one of these six scenarios. The other five have their own alternative ways of generating income. I'm going to put the cart before the ox here and claim that the bottom three characters' routes are all filler. But these top three, play off each other like fine dining. It's truly incredible, and I was not expecting this level of storytelling that is present in New Horizons. And as usual, it's not what is told, but how. Each campaign receives bits and pieces of an overarching plot. These top three scenarios events are intertwined so that you don't start piecing things together until completion of your second or even third campaign. And walking away, that's what impressed me the most. So let's take a look at these characters. Joao is the son of our protagonist from the first game. He is 18 years old and wants to step out of his father's shadow by finding the lost city of Atlantis. Classic human mythology, the lost city of Atlantis. And honestly, my pessimism was in full swing because I thought that sounded lame. Only to eventually play through his questline and be proven wrong yet again. Catalina, also 18, has her fiancé murdered by a Portuguese battle fleet. She vows revenge and... She steals the show. Mine, and probably everyone else who has played New Horizons' favorite character. Ali, 19, is a Turkish merchant. He's like the Torniko Taloon of Uncharted Waters. His scenario is about accumulating as much wealth and growing the Turkish Empire with foreign investments as much as possible. Ernst, 23, is the character I selected first, and he's a cartographer on a quest to map out the entire world. Otto, 25. Wait, this guy is 25? Oh! Otto is a British military general, and his country is at war with Spain. Pietro, 33, is an adventurer. He doesn't really have a main goal to start, but eventually attempts to find the golden city of El Dorado. As mentioned a second ago, I picked Ernst to start, because mapping out the entire planet seemed like it would make a great introductory. And after all, Uncharted Waters could have just been a world mapping simulator, and I would still be in love with it. As a kid, I used to hang maps on my walls, one of the world, one of the US, one of the great state of New York, homemade maps of Shining in the Darkness on Sega Genesis, whatever maps I could get my hands on, up on the wall. Still today, I browse Google Maps for fun, but in hindsight, ironically, Ernst ended up being my least favorite scenario. Despite the description, you don't beat his game by actually mapping out the entire planet. Early on, you meet this girl, 14 years old. They go out of their way to say that she is 14 years old. She was an orphan and has no idea where she's originally from. After traveling around, you not only find the city she's from, but her childhood house and her family still lives there and recognizes her all these years later. What's dumb is how this game makes it so you can't even see Japanese ports because it would make the game end too early. You can sail to Japan. The game allows you to physically travel to Japan Nagasaki is supposed to be right here, 
only it's not because your fame and adventure isn't at 40,000 yet. Ernst is supposed to be the cartographer. Why can every other character see these ports, no barrier to entry required, but Ernst can't? These three numbers are the lifeblood of Uncharted Waters New Horizons. They represent your fame and adventure, battling, and merchantry. Most story events in New Horizons are triggered by these numbers. In Ernst's campaign, that simply means that as this number rises, you obtain new dialogue between yourself, that girl, and your first mate. Dialogue which, as the game goes on, becomes increasingly more romantic. She's 14, you're 23. I mean, I guess in the 1500s that wasn't a big deal, but it's a little awkward today. He's like, why didn't they just say Ernst was 18, like two of the other characters? That's a freshman to senior in high school. Still a little weird, but I don't know, I've been there. It's not like we were having sex or anything, but when I was 14, I went on a few little innocent dates with an 18-year-old. Though again, I suppose it's a different dynamic when the guy is younger. Anyway, questionable relationships aside, you gain fame and adventure in any one of four ways. By visiting foreign ports, the further away from Europe, the better. By completing missions for guilds, which can involve finding items, delivering cargo, or any number of things. Honestly, I only did two of these throughout all six of my playthroughs throughs combined, so you can safely ignore these and get by just fine. By mapping out the world and reporting it to Ma Mercator. Yes, the same Mercator, whose name is on all modern world maps. But the fastest is to discover cultural artifacts of the world and to sell them. Finding these is almost like playing an educational game. And they follow Earthbound Dungeon Man principles. Items that are easy to get are often disappointing. You generally gain more fame, more money, by finding things off the beaten path. It's a wonderful way to incentivize you to travel to remote areas of the planet. Normally, there would be no reason to seek out Easter Island because there's almost no population there. There's nothing to gain. But when you can go there, sell a Moe head for 200,000 gold and 3,000 adventure points, suddenly combing the Pacific for remote islands becomes a can't-miss proposition. And that is it for Ernst. You take the girl home, but she decides a life with you at sea would be better. His quest is the only one which does not tie into the broader narrative whatsoever. It's also the most simplistic. You never need to fight anyone, you needn't engage with any trading mechanics. It is just a straightforward, raise your fame until the game decides that Japan is no longer invisible. Completed in 11 hours and 21 minutes. Next I picked Otto. Oldest 25 year old in existence. Everyone hates him to start. You're tasked to bring down the entire Spanish fleet and are only given 300 gold. And as a rib, this guy names your ship Simpleton. Something I love about video games of this era era are obvious alcohol censorship moments. There's a bar at almost every port in this game, and you can always buy a local drink there. Come to Bordeaux, France and try our world famous, why, I mean, grape juice. How about Japan and its world famous, uh, green tea? Or Russia, where you can try our, va mint tea. How would you like our coffee? How would you like our coconut milk? Stuff like that. Otto is British and the drink you can buy at the bar in London is fish and chips. That's hilarious. Your main source of income here is attacking enemy fleets. You win whatever gold they had on board, can steal whatever cargo they were carrying around to sell yourself, but what makes the most amount of money is capturing ships and selling those off. It takes a bit of extra effort because you need to find and hire more captains, more crews, and war is expensive. Otto and Catalina are two battle-centric characters. You'll always be strapped for cash on these two playthroughs. Compare our expenses to Ernst. He can sail around the world with the ship you start out on, with a crew of 20 people, without hiring any other captains. Otto needs to create his own navy from scratch, maintaining expensive warships, paying for cannons, paying for ammo, paying for the crew to run these ships, over a thousand men. When people die in battle, you need to travel from port to port, recruiting replacements. You can't just sail around picking fights all the time. If you don't do all this preparation, then you're gonna get stomped. Battles themselves are cathartic. In the original Uncharted Waters, you could cheese these fights by having everyone target your opponent's flagship, because if you take that out, you win automatically. Well. No longer, because now you only control one ship, the one you're on. If you know me, you know how much I love auto battle. And here, I earnestly believe it to be the correct choice, 
because battles already take long enough. If you had to select each one of your ship's actions every single time, it would double their length. You can also challenge other commanders to a duel, where a loss results in a game over, back to the title screen, and a win ends the battle as a victory. Same as if you sunk the flagship. I know I was confused as hell the first time looking at this screen, but when you break it down, it's almost like a slightly more complicated game of rock, paper, scissors. You have thrusts, lunges, and strike cards. You'll always have at least one of each. And depending on what the enemy selects, your attack will either be successful or not. These numbers represent power in the case of a successful attack. Damage is also affected by which equipment you have on. But I appreciate the random nature of these duels. It's not a foolproof way to win any given battle, and as a result, I only really used it in desperation scenarios. It's a flip of the coin, a roll of the die. If you're backed up against the wall, sure, try a duel. But if you have the advantage, then why bother? Otto's campaign is really that simple. You beat up on Spanish fleets until your piracy number is high enough. Then the game decides it's time to fight the biggest and baddest Spanish fleet. Completion time was 11 hours, 34 minutes. He intersects with a couple other characters, but overall, Otto doesn't affect the plot a whole lot either. I'm impressed with myself that I managed to select the two least relevant characters first and second. Ernst and Otto are the weakest campaigns, no doubt. Then thirdly, I picked Ali, who is a more traditional merchant type. His main source of income is buying low, selling high. He also used to have a sister who went missing a long time ago. And no, that she doesn't end up being the same girl from Ernst. Quest. Ali is completely broke, but he has a fantastic business idea, which is no more complex or thought out than buying and selling indiscriminate goods. He goes door to door in Istanbul, begging people to invest in him. He then promises to pay back their investment tenfold. He guarantees a 1000% return on their investment which is the craziest thing I have ever heard. All in all, you end up owing various people around town a total of 40,000 gold, which is not very much in this game. That's only four gold bars. Hell, you could win that playing poker. The original Uncharted Waters had Texas Hold'em style, which is replaced with Blackjack here. Less fun, but it's more efficient at making money. See here, what you do is save before playing, bet the maximum of 500 gold, then go double or nothing a few times, and you'll end up with a nice chunk of change. I won't spoil what happens with the rest of Ali's storyline, because it's worth experiencing for yourself. I compared him to Torniko Taloon earlier, and I will say that his final objective was to amass 699 gold bars, which is a lot in this game. Even with all these alternative ways of making money New Horizons introduces, Ali proves that trading is still king. His took me the longest of the six, at a still perfectly manageable 16 hours and 43 minutes. Ali was when I realized that these six campaigns might be attempting to tell a broader narrative greater than all of them. That there might be something going on in the background that I wasn't privy to yet. But again, since I picked the two least relevant characters to start, nothing was really clicking yet. Though something was crystal clear. Joao and Catalina were without a doubt the two most important central protagonists, so I decided to save them for last. Naturally, that leaves Pietro to knock out next. Pietro's dad recently died and he assumed all of his debt. And thank goodness that's not how the world works anymore because when my dad dies, I had a debt collector contact me and after a quick Google search, I told him to suck my ass. And I'm not gonna go in depth with him either because Ernst and Pietro's campaigns are 90% the same. Just swap out finding an orphan girl's home to finding the lost golden city of El Dorado. It's still just a simple numbers game about increasing your fame using the exact same methods I did with Ernst. It only took me six hours, 35 minutes, because I already did all this before. I already knew exactly where I was looking and where to find all the good treasures to sell. His ending is where events start to get spicy. The original Uncharted Waters opens with a cutscene, explaining how your dad was this prolific sailor who was caught in a horrible storm and shipwrecked. Presumably he died, but Pietro happens to find him and then reunites father with his son, the protagonist from the first game, and by extension his grandson, Joao from this game. Remember when I outlined the disease of Moore at the onset of this video? New Horizons 
has too many campaigns. They had enough ideas to fill three, but the other half are noticeably disconnected. Pietro's ending is the only thing bringing him into the fold, and it could have just as easily have been accomplished by Joao at some point during his adventure. Here I run into a bit of a crisis. Do I punish New Horizons for attempting to do too much? I believe it wholeheartedly to be a better experience, both in totality and in each individual way over the original, but one just had a single campaign, and this one has basically three wastes of time. Okay, maybe that's a little harsh. Even our filler characters are still fun, but it's an opportunity cost thing. There's no reason to play Pietro or Ernst because Joao's path is also centered around raising your fame and adventure, only his is far superior. That's who I picked next, and at its core, it was another numbers game, trying to get your fame and adventure up to trigger story events, but Joao has way more of those events, and his plotline is compelling enough that I'm not going to spoil what happens. And alongside adventuring, the story events sprinkle in a little bit of everything. There's forced duels, combat, political lobbying. His took me 14 hours and 7 minutes, even though I already knew what I was doing after doing the last two adventuring quests. They packed his full of the most stuff in the game. And if you're interested in playing Uncharted Waters New Horizons, and you're only going to do one playthrough, I would recommend Joao. Which only leaves Catalina. She's combat-oriented like Otto, and minute to minute, it's mostly the same. Main differences between her and Otto, well, firstly look at her, but her storyline is both better and integrates with New Horizons larger events in a more meaningful way. She's like the anti joao and you spend most of your story missions attempting to track him down. She's awesome, but she's probably also the most difficult. One of her final missions sees the entire Spanish military hunt you down, which almost softlocked my save because I had absolutely no chance of winning this fight fairly. I needed a fluke duel win just to get out of this fight. Uncharted Waters New Horizons is the definition of niche. It's not for everyone, but it sure is for me. It's going in excellent tier, and I'm downgrading the original to great. It snaps a five game streak of titles that I did not enjoy, dating all the way back to Final Fantasy III. I'm glad I finally got into it, and it's going to be sad saying goodbye and moving on to our next game. Speaking of, the patrons have spoken, and Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War is our winner. But, before we get there, at the request of one William Robert Lee, who gave me more money than anyone should ever give a stranger on the internet, we're going to take a pit stop with the unreleased Spellcrafts and the Aspects of Valor. I don't know anything about this game. I don't even know if it's possible to complete it, but I'm sure going to try. Anyway, never trust anyone who needs a haircut. Goodbye.